Hey everybody, I'm Charles Yarber with Fixated Real Estate, and today I'm gonna to go over this two bedroom, one bath property that we bought for $95,000 just outside of Seattle, Washington a couple of years ago, and then invested $75,000 into the rehab, fixed it all up, and it appraised for $285,000, which then allowed us to do what's called an infinite burr. And that's the topic today. I'm gonna to show you how we did a buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, got all our money out, which means we have no money into this deal, wouldn't you like that too? And how we cash flow every single month on this property. Recently, spoiler alert, it appraised for $380,000. And I'm going to show you why it's better to keep these properties versus flipping them like I've done for years. I'm a recovering house flipper. Just want to admit that. And I'm going to show you how we acquired this property, how we did the entire rehab process, the challenges, the pro tips that go in with it, and even some tips and tricks that might help you guys be able to do this for yourself in the future for you and your business. So stay tuned with us and let's get after it right now. Now let's get into this. As I said, we bought this property for $95,000 a couple of years ago. And we decided to keep it as a burr by rehab, rent, refinance, repeat, instead of flipping it like we normally do. We flipped hundreds of houses in my career and we made a lot of money doing it. However, my number one regret as a recovering house flipper is not keeping more of these properties. And by the end of this video, you're going to see why it's so much more powerful to keep these things than just sell them right out flat unless you need the cash today, which by the end of this video, maybe you would decide to have sold it instead of keeping it like we've done. Who knows? You guys decide for yourself. So this property, this two bedroom, one bath house is 784 square feet on a smaller lot, but it's got a massive two car garage. So look at this house. So a little messed up uh, in the front, and it's just got vinyl siding, nothing special. It's an old house that was built in 1925. So it's got a lot of things wrong with it, especially when it's built in 1925 and it hasn't been remodeled or updated very, very much. Now the vinyl siding is probably the newest thing that happened on this property. You can see the outside electrical panel for us, that's a Federal Pacific panel. Uh, those are a no-go in our area. You look, talk to electricians and inspectors, you'll figure that out for yourself. But for us, right away, we know that we're going to have to replace the rehab. No, sorry, replace the rehab. Replace the panel on that stuff. So there's a couple grand right there. We also notice a few little other issues, like the windows busted out. These are Not all of these are vinyl windows. They're a little bit older. It's got a newer roof, which is fantastic. Uh, we definitely like that, a metal roof. That's extremely rare for us to find in our neck of the woods, at least. Uh, we also have this thing here. This is called an oil tank. So an oil tank on a property in our area is not necessarily a good thing. doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's got a very dated system in it. Some of those are very good still, depending on where you live. And us, in our neck of the woods, that's telling us right now that we're probably going to need to replace the uh, furnace uh, in this property because it's probably a much older unit uh, that we're just not going to want to keep. So that's a warning sign for us to go look out for that. Now, the rest of this property, there's a best thing about it that we loved more than anything is that at some point in the last 80 years, somebody built this incredible two-car garage on this property. Now, what gave us interest in this property as well, besides this two-car garage, is we thought that one day, maybe we can convert this garage into a DADU. That's a detached accessory dwelling unit, which are becoming extremely popular, especially in our neck of the woods, to add another unit to this property. Depending on your jurisdiction, here's a pro tip, you can convert detached garage into dadus very easily depending on what city you're in. So if you're in a major city, a lot of cities are allowing you to do this, this these days. So take a look at that. Now we didn't do that on this property just because of rehab purposes and time and we didn't care as much at the time, but we thought one day we might wanna do it. So that was a good bonus for us for long-term thinking. Now. Uh, on the other side of this, you go back into the house itself. You can see it's kind of overgrown, hasn't been lived in for a very, very long time. Uh, and it's your typical older craftsman home, older hardwoods that have just been worn out forever, multiple flooring levels. Uh, you have these old base trim, which is, looks really nice, which we like. But you see this these cracks that start to show up from lath and plaster, not drywall, lath and plaster, that from settling over the years on a property like this, a 100-year-old property, you start to get some major cracks in those things. Uh, it's not the most well-kept property, which is the best ones that we like out there because that means you could buy them for a screaming deal uh, versus highly fixed up properties. How do you get a burr, right, when a property is already fixed up? That's just buying a turnkey property. That's not a burr. Uh, this entryway, this is very, very normal in uh, older homes where they have like these French kind of cool doors going into separate bedrooms, but it makes it more into dens uh, and not a traditional bedroom that we're looking for. So we definitely put that as a as a keynote that we are sorry key rehab element to be able to make this a two bedroom house. 
is what we needed. So going into it, older doors, we always like these old doors, but when they're kind of beat up like this, it usually costs more to refurbish them and make them nicer uh, than it does just to get brand new ones. Uh, you can see this massive grate. Uh, what usually these older houses were, especially when they're small, this is a 780 square foot house. Uh, you have this, this is probably where all 100% of the heat came up from the basement uh, area from the furnace because there's no registers anywhere else, floor registers on this house. So those are typically needing to go as well. So you learn all this stuff when you flip old houses. Now, where you live, you might have newer houses. Who knows? In our area, you kind of become an expert in older homes the more that you do this, and you start looking for warning signs like that. You can see right away here, this was old lath and plaster with the traditional two-by-fours behind it. Uh, those are true two-by-fours, old school. Uh, and you're going to need to do some repairs and so forth, which lath and plaster, cheating over that with sheetrock always kind of sucks, but you got to do it. Uh, there's a tiny closet, so that's good. There's those French doors we're probably going to get rid of. Uh, and of course, here's the other bad bedroom uh, that we're just looking for normal stuff and whoever Samoa was uh, and so forth. And then we go into the bathroom. The bathroom of this house, you can see there's no shower. You have a cool clawfoot tub, which are very popular out there today. And sometimes you can get a little bit of money selling these things instead of just throwing them out. Because a lot of people like to refurbish those or use them even outside for different aspects. But there's some really cool things you could do with old clawfoot tubs, cast iron clawfoot tubs unless they are just banged up, dented up, and destroyed. But some of these you could refurbish and maybe get a little bit of money out of it or save some money on demo uh, by basically giving them away for free. Uh, but there's no shower, right? So we know we're going to need to solve that. And one of the issues with having no shower here is that this window is set up to also have no shower. So imagine putting a shower here. The water is just going to smash right into that window. So that's kind of a thing we got to deal with uh, potentially, depending on how we seal this thing up uh, and make it so it's waterproof. Why don't you want that? It's because if you have a shower just smashing onto this window for years and years and years, and it's not completely sealed up and waterproof, which, which is kind of hard to do, uh, then you're going to rot out all the framing underneath it over the course of many, many years. So we know we're going to need to change up this bathroom. we got a tiny little vanity. Uh, it's not really conducive, conducive for the comps comparables that are in this area. We're going to want to fix that up. So while we're going through this, so far, this kind of is a cosmetic re rehab that we just need to make it a nicely updated property, right? So, of course, we're going to rip all that crap out. And we go to the kitchen. And in the kitchen, you know, it's a cool little kitchen. It's got a little peekaboo window here that goes into the washer dryer area, which is just a mechanical, I'm sorry, utility room. Uh, the, uh, the cabinets are not in the best condition, but we already know the way we do our properties. Since we're going to be updating these fully uh, to the top level that we can, we're going to gut it out and just put all new cabinets and countertops in it anyways. But we want to modernize it as much as possible. We love taking old craftsman homes and turning them back into like a craftsman feel with modern amenities. That's something that we really enjoy uh, in our, our neck of the woods, at least. So you got the standing stove right here. That's no good today. People don't like that. We want to might kind of incorporate that into the actual property itself. Uh, and you'll see what we do for the design later. Something also to note on these older homes, you might wonder why there's just a bump out right here. Uh, that's typically because down in the basement, there is a, um, a flue of some sort, like a chimney, right? So there's a chimney underneath there. And if you're planning on opening up these entire walls, this is the wall between the kitchen and the living room. You know, watch enough HDTV, you say you need to open up the kitchen. That's pretty much the formula to everything, right? Then in that case, you're going to have some load issues, but also you're going to have this chimney that you're going to need to remove and have a hole in the ceiling, a hole in the roof that you're going to need to judge uh, for as well. So for us, we didn't want to open up this whole thing because we didn't want to deal with that because we were going to keep the furnace and everything else down in the basement, uh, which we'll show you what we mean by that later. So we're going to need something to have some sort of flue to come out with the uh, uh, furnace down below. And also, we didn't want to rip it all out and save money. Something to consider as well. Mechanical room uh, or the mud room, sorry, the mud room is a piece of crap, <laughs> for lack of a better word. There's a lot of messed up stuff here. Uh, and you know, up here, everything is all mildewy. There's kind of, for whatever reason, it wasn't doing the best in there. There's mold building up in certain areas, uh, not good airflow. So we needed to fix that uh, and look into that a little bit more. Lots of windows, believe it or not. Uh, so you're spending, there's one, two, three, four windows just in the mud room. So if depending on how much your windows are and plus install, that could be 400 bucks a window at least. Uh, and so you're spending 1600 bucks just in windows in the mud room, but you figure out that number for yourself. Uh, sometimes it's cheaper just to side over them. So you save some money on uh, the amount of windows that might be in there. Uh, we didn't do that, but that's what something to consider. Up there, you can see there's some rot. So we're going to definitely need to fix that. 
Uh, if you push your finger through that, that's one way to test out if you have dry rot or not. You take a pencil or you take a pen or you take a uh, screwdriver or even your finger or car keys and just shove it into that wood. And if it keeps going, then that means it's rotted out. That's a good little test. There's a pro tip for you. Just start sticking keys into wood, right? And see if it gets squishy or not. Uh, outside of that, nothing else really special. However, there's an issue with the basement, which we haven't gotten to. I'm going to dive into those pictures here in a second. And this is going to be a big pro tip for you guys on how we handle basements and foundation issues on properties like this, which is going to lead into whether or not you should keep these properties, work on them, uh, get experts involved, go over budget, analyze, blah, blah, blah. Those are all things that factor into doing a great burr, whether or not you should keep it. Because we might budget on a house like this, $75,000 in rehab, which I'll show you why we budgeted that here in a moment. But once you start going over that budget, and it might work, if that budget works for you as a burr, that means you're going to get an infinite burr and all your money out of it. But you go over that budget because maybe you didn't see some foundation issues, which this property has some major foundation issues, which surprise, spoiler alert, I'm about to review with you. Uh, and you don't budget for those things, then you might have another 10, 15, $20,000 in costs that now make it not look like a very good burr for you because you're going to have to leave a lot of money into it. In which case, my first real pro tip is you cannot have a good burr without it being a good flip. So every burr must be a great flip. However, not every great flip is a great burr. So keep that in mind. So in this type of property, if we have two exit strategies, which is another great pro tip, always do your best to have multiple exit strategies. This property, we had two. We could flip it or we can burr it. If we mess up the burr, right, which means we go over budget, a few things you know, don't go right, and it doesn't cash flow or can't get all our money out, we can always sell the property as a flip. Now, there's a lot of properties out there that are great flips, but they're not great burrs because maybe they don't cash flow. Maybe you can't get all your money out of them and blah, 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 blah. Those are all mathematical things that us investors must be good at using the right uh, formulas and the right uh, spreadsheets and so forth or the Bigger Pockets Burr Calculator. Check it out on biggerpockets.com. They'll help you figure all that stuff out. Now, I want to show you guys the floor plan briefly on this property and how simple it is, right? So we do these on a little back of uh, napkin, pa uh, napkins or pa paper or whatever. So when we're taking 100 photos of these things while we're walking them, we also want to take a very quick, very simple floor plan so it's very easy for us to review what it might look like. It doesn't get simpler than this, right? Bedroom one, bedroom two, bathroom, kitchen, and a little mud room on the top. Can everybody do that? Yes, or a five-year-old can do that. Yeah, I don't have a five-year-old. But if you did, uh, then they can also do that as well and make them very nice for you, maybe even better than some uh, drafters out there and architects and a lot cheaper. Now, with that basic plan, you could then actually review these properties and floor plans and kind of change things around uh, and kind of get an idea of the flow of a property. Now, do you need an actual um, real legit AutoCAD or Home Designer Pro or architectural designer or anything like that to have floor plan to make a property like this work? You might. You might need that, especially if you're getting permits uh, or especially if you're working with contractors or really changing the dramatic, sorry, contractors that need them, uh, then are really changing the floor plans on these properties. Now, on this particular property, we only changed the floor plan a little bit. Now, on the left of your screen there, you'll see that this is just the bathroom and the kitchen. These are the only areas that we were changing on this property. So we didn't get really crazy with some big, huge floor plan thing, right? So you can do this with a variety of different programs. You can pay somebody to do it. For us, we do it in-house now. Uh, Home Designer Pro is what we use for most of our stuff. It's pretty cheap uh, and user-friendly. But the kitchen here, you can see, remember from the pictures, it was just a almost a galley style or whatever the heck you call these things, uh, and a freestanding stove chilling there. And then you got your bathroom here, uh, which was not a good configuration. So we decided to change it up a little bit. We did an L-shaped kitchen, and we did this peekaboo window that separates the living room from the kitchen. So instead of opening up the entire floor plan, and having to remove this chimney that's here, and this is a load-bearing wall in this house, uh, we decided instead to do a peekaboo window, so it's almost like a bar top on the other side leading into the, to the living room, to make it have a better open feel, because it is a pretty small house. And then we also changed the door swing on the bathroom and moved the bathroom door just a couple inches over so we can get a traditional bathroom setup of a vanity toilet and then a true uh, tub, uh, tub shower combo and stuff as well. So not very much needed to be changed. This is good enough for permits for the most part for a lot of jurisdictions if this is the only area that you are working on on the property. There's like always every jurisdiction is going to ask you for a few extra things uh, to make sure that you are doing it right and to code. 
Uh, but you're going to need to find that out for yourself. By jurisdiction, I mean your city uh, or wherever you live that you're doing these properties on for permitting. This was good enough for the city we were in. We had to do a few other little changes that we added on in the actual plan set, but we didn't need to do a whole one for the entire house because we were only making a few minor changes, uh, mainly in the bathroom for the most part. Now, I said earlier that one of the big surprises on this property was the foundation. Now, you can't tell this from photos. Now, I'm a huge proponent on photos. Another pro tip to throw out there, take a ton of photos, right? Uh, bleep me out on this one. Take a ton of photos, right? You need to take as many photos as possible, in my opinion, in the correct order so it's easier for you to walk it you know, and so forth uh, and also review back to them. Now, photos do one thing that they does one thing wrong, which it doesn't show you how it feels in the property. And that's how the property level, uh, if there's any kind of like quirkiness, things are out of plumb, it's hard to get those on photos correctly. This property was a little bit on level in certain areas, which is a warning sign that the property is settling or there's some foundation problems on the house. And this property here, you can see that there's an actual like crawl space entrance here of some sort to go into a basement. Now, we didn't know what was under there at first, so we started decided to look into that in extreme depth while we had this property under contract. And going into it, this is kind of what it looks like once you walk into this thing. Uh, and there's like a little muddy area and so forth that you have to walk down and you slip and slide on down this little muddy area to try to get down it. Uh, and this is what it started looking like. It's not the best quality, but you can see there's just a ton of junk in there. But what's kind of hard to see a little bit on this is that most of this is dirt. So you have this footing. There we go. So you have this footing all the way around this property. This is the perimeter foundation. And then it's just a bunch of dirt because somebody hand dug this entire what used to be crawl space out to try to make it a full basement. That's a big no-no <laughs> when you do that. Uh, and it, and they, then they just hack jobbed all these posts and beams. Uh, this is not the correct way to sister two beams together. Uh, this is a very bad way to do that. Uh, and you can all see that they just have some bottle jacks just holding up the house. So you wonder why the house is kind of crooked. Uh, you have this undermined uh, area here of dirt with this little footing area within like six inches of the dirt. So it could just slush off and this house can continue to sink. Uh, so it's always kind of fun and a little crazy when you walk into these 100-year-old houses to see what people did over the course of the last 100 years. Here's another bottle jack just sitting there uh, in the crawl space, or sorry, in the foundation as well. And here's another thing too. You can see that this is all dirt over here. It's kind of hard with the photos, uh, but this is dirt and this is the actual perimeter footing right here that has nothing underneath it holding it up. Uh, this is another area. You can see some dirt and some footing issues as well. So, and you gotta love this. This is uh, just a bunch of cement and a couple of bricks just holding up this end of the house as well too. So a little bit better here. This is a good one as well. Uh, you can see that this is dirt with a cinder block of cement of some force with a two by eight or, or sorry, like a four by 10 uh, being with a post on top of that holding up that beam. Uh, so little bit of issues, right? Now, here's a great pro tip for you. When it comes to major structural issues like this foundation, in my opinion, and I could be wrong on this, depending on where you're at, in my opinion, I'd rather have an engineer or somebody structurally licensed to go review this thing with me and help me make a plan to make it secure direct versus going to one of those fancy billboard, radio ad, TV ad, foundation specialist companies, right, that is out there everywhere uh, to be, that's going to charge me a ton of money to be able to set the entire plan for me. So here's the kind of a thing. If a retail homeowner, retail means like a regular homeowner, refers you to a foundation company, uh, it's probably because they heard them on a radio ad or television ad. Those are the expensive contractors that do this stuff. That's not really good for us budget investors that are out there. So a little bit easier to go direct to the experts at times, to the civil engineer, structural engineer, whatever. Get them to make a nice little plan for you. Uh, make sure they understand how to work on houses like this so they can keep it cheap and affordable and legit. That's going to make the city right. And then find the contractor that can do the work. If they have a billboard or television ad, they are probably the wrong contractor for you because they're probably going to be way over budget for you. But that's different for everybody, depending on where you are. That's kind of helped me over the years. I'd rather deal direct with the expert and then sub it out directly to the contractor, especially when it's a big job like this. And here's the last pro tip on this one. If this type of stuff scares you, don't buy the house, right? This was, this is, we've done a lot of properties like this, so this was not something that scared us away, but it's what got us the house. This foundation issue, this property challenge, scared away so many other investors, and it also allowed us to get a great deal on this property. 
In fact, in order for us to be able to purchase it for the $95,000, there was multiple people that owned this house as a family. It was actually in a, um, a trust situation. Basically, somebody passed away uh, and they needed to sell it. They couldn't sell it on market. They didn't want to. A lot of the people didn't get along. Uh, and they found us. And some people thought it was worth more. They thought it was 125000 Some people thought it was worth less. And these are the people that own the property. So we decided to get a foundation expert in there, like a civil engineer, uh, sorry, this way, a structural engineer, give us up a proposal what it might take to actually fix that foundation. And then we gave it to an appraiser. And we had the appraiser do an analysis on this property. We paid for the appraisal to do this with the information knowing the foundation was as jacked up as it was. That then brought a value of about $90,000 to the property. Now, why did we buy it for 95 and not 90? Is because some of the homeowners, some of the people that own this property in the trust still thought it was worth 120. And we were able to go on that middle ground of 95,000, plus they had some fees and so forth they had to pay. So the foundation gave us the property as affordably as we needed to do it. Now, were we able to spend a lot of money on that foundation? No, we spent about $10,000 fixing up that entire foundation when we had bids originally from those fancy TV ad companies for twenty dollars and $30,000 plus. So there's plenty of ways to get it done right. City approved it. Everything was fantastic. Uh, but there's lots of ways to do it. And it's too much to get into on this video. All right. So I told you already, guys, already we spent about $75,000 on this property. I'm actually going to show you in rehab. I'm going to show you exactly what we spent. It was a little over $78,000. We went slightly over budget. We're about to get into all the numbers and why you're here so that you guys could learn from them as well. And before we do that, Let's show you some pretty photos of what this property looked like when we were done with it. So check this sucker out. This thing looks gorgeous, right? So also, uh, when you hire a professional photographer to take your listing photos, this is even better for you. Now, we rented this out. These are the exact photos. You're a tenant. You're somebody looking for a really cute house in Tacoma, Washington. And you see one homeowner that actually, or sorry, one landlord that took photos from their cell phone, right? And did no, you know, nothing to it or whatever. They just uh, put them up there and they're blurry and messed up. Versus I spent 150 bucks paying a professional photographer to take great photos for us. Whose house are you going to rent, right? I promise you, you're probably going to look at ours first because these photos are amazing. There's that two-car garage. Look in the back. Now, kind of a cool thing we ended up doing with that back area on this property here is we had uh, that basement area that we had to get into. We built a cool little deck here. And there's a handle right on this area here that lifts open the entire deck so you could walk down into it, almost like a storm cellar. Uh, and very surprising to us, after we trashed out the property and did some pressure washing, we had no idea all this stone stuff was here. Uh, it's always kind of fun to, to discover stuff like that. So there's that two-car garage once more going into the house. Ta-da! There's that peekaboo window with the little bar top that we threw on there. We put luxury vinyl planking on this thing because that's what we do with all of our rentals to keep the flooring nice and clean while we work on, uh, sorry, while we keep it for years. Uh, and we also kept that Craftsman base trim. We had to replace all of it, but we kept the same style. So that way it kept that feel. There's that L-shaped kitchen, a little bit more traditional for you as well. Refrigerator goes there. Um, and there's that, uh, whatever we call it, mud room as well, which we kept all the windows because it was too much to find vital siding and we didn't want to deal with it. So that was a little bit more than we wanted to spend, but whatever. Uh, we always do a little bit higher end finishes because we don't want to change the finishes between our flips and our burrs. That's another little tip for you. We try to keep our flips and burrs the same finishes. So that way, if we decide to sell it at any time, uh, we could sell it at the highest value possible, plus also get the highest appraisal possible. Bedrooms, nothing special, just clean. And we always put carpet in the bedroom, save a little bit of money. Uh, and there's that bathroom that we made more of a traditional bathroom. And we did put a little bit of, bit of money, making this window a little bit smaller. Uh, but we also waterproofed the crap out of this thing just in case uh, and made it more traditional as well. Moving into, I also hate this tile, by the way. Sorry, Serena, for picking it out, but whatever. <laughs> so not my job, not my lane. That's what she does. Uh, there's that mud room and going into that two-car garage, which is the coolest thing on the property, in my opinion, because it's nice and new. And we still one day might convert this into a dadu. Let's go over the actual number. We bought it for $95,500 after all closing costs, and we projected we were going to put seventy-five grand into it. Now, in reality, we put $78,112 into it. A good chunk of that was the foundation. A lot of that was because we replaced all the electrical. We had to redo the entire furnace system and so forth. Uh, but we budgeted most of these things into it. But the foundation crawl space was where the majority of the money came from, waterproofing it and so forth, blah, 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 blah. 
Now, we also uh, decided to keep this thing because we're like, wow, this thing did really, really well. Let's go ahead and get an appraisal. And it appraised for $285,000 back in 2018 when we bought this thing. And we decided to do a 70%, just under 70% loan to value appraisal. And we took a loan out for $195,000. Now, why is that? Because we had $75,000 rehab, sorry, $78,000 of rehab. We had $95,000 purchase. And plus we had holding costs, right? So we were borrowing this at a 10% interest rate that we had to pay. And after seven months of rehab and permits and remodeling, plus also putting a tenant in it for that, which takes about 30 days as well. We had about eight months of holding costs from start to finish that we had to account for. Uh, and we had to pay all that back so we can get what's called an infinite burr. So do a cash out refi for 195,000, get money back in our pocket, have no money into it. We pretty much balanced out at zero. We got a few grand into our pocket at the end of the day. We basically netted zero dollars out, but we then rented this thing for $1,625 a month to a tenant when our principal interest taxes insurance, PITI, on our $195,000 mortgage at a 4.75% interest rate was $1,267. Now that's principal, interest, taxes, and insurance for $1,267, netting us a cash flow before any property management fees of $358 a month. Woo! 350 bucks a month coming in before property management which could be 8% of whatever the rents are and so forth. So you got to subtract for that. Now we self-manage in our, in our area here. Uh, so we don't account for that as much. We do pay ourselves a property management fee, but in our analysis, because it comes right back to us, uh, we don't really account for that, but you need to do that for yourself. And that's important. So uh, now 350 bucks a month cash flow, or if you do the math, if we would have sold this thing in 2018, this is where you have to decide for yourself. This is a big number. If we would have sold it for $285,000, paid real estate commissions, excise tax, all that stuff we normally have to do, we would have netted $77,166 net profit. So do you keep it or do you sell it? In 2018, we could have sold this thing and made $77,000 net or keep it with no money in your out of pocket and make $350 net before property management fees or any capital gains, or sorry, capital expenditures or anything like that. Most of us out there might go 350 bucks a month or $77,000. This is why this pro tip is important. Burrs are fantastic if you don't need the money. I'll say that again. Burrs are fantastic if you don't need the money. Now, if you're flipping a lot of houses like I was, especially in 2018, I didn't need the money. So keeping it for 350 bucks a month cash flow and not getting that $77,000 net profit at that time, and paying taxes on that later, right? That was more important to me to do the infinite burr. Now, why is that important as well? Is because years later, it's now 2021, and we just did another appraisal on this property, and we're looking at doing another cash out because we never touched this property since. It recently appraised for $380,000. Say that again, recently appraised for $380,000, which means... After principal buy down, all that kind of stuff and everything over the course of the last couple of years, if we decide to sell it today, then we're netting probably a little over 180, $180,000 to $185,000 instead by waiting because we just decided to wait a little bit longer, right? So we still cash flow that three fifty dollars a month. We are going to probably do what's called a cash out refi again at that three eighty dollars mark, but at a 4% interest rate, which will then keep our payments the same that they were at 12, 8, 12 60 a month, which is going to be great. Uh, and we'll be able to pull out right around fifty, sixty thousand dollars at that at that moment. So keeping it for years has been great. However, once again, that's birds are fantastic if you don't need the money today. There's a property right now that I'll probably do a video on later that if we kept this property, this is a different property I'm talking about now, that if we keep the property right now, it'll be an infinite burr for four hundred dollars a month cash flow. But if I sold it right now, we net $197,000 net profit if we sold it today. I'm probably going to take that almost 200 grand profit on this flip that we're doing uh, in the Seattle area instead of $400 a month cash flow. Not because we need the money. I just think that it's better to do that right now uh, from where I'm at on that particular property. So you got to decide that. So once again, every great burr is also a great flip, but not every great flip is a great burr. And burrs are fantastic if you don't need the money today, but in the long run, it always pays off if you do it right.
So my name is Tarl Yarber. I hope this helped you guys. You can always follow me on Instagram at Tarl Yarber. Make sure you comment, like, subscribe. This is Bigger Pockets. So the more comments you put on this, the more, more ability we have to answer your questions. And that said, if you guys like this video, let me know because we want to make more of these for you. And I'll see you guys on the next video soon.